Well, good evening. We welcome you here to the prayer service and Bible study time uh, here at uh, Cannon Baptist Church. And I'm glad to be back with you this evening. And I hope you've had a great day. Uh, we are going to start with our Bible study tonight. Uh, scripture comes out of the Gospel of Matthew, the very first chapter, beginning with the very first verse. Uh, if you know anything about the Gospel of Matthew or how the New Testament starts off, you say, oh my, isn't that one of those uh, genealogical listings? Uh, lots of names that are hard to pronounce, etc., etc. And yes, that's exactly true. Uh, but I want us to think tonight about uh, looking forward by looking backwards. Uh, looking forward to the Christmas season and what it means to us as God's people, uh, but also taking a look backwards, as Matthew does, to see the lineage of Jesus. Uh, and there's some interesting things that you'll find here about uh, who uh, was a part of Jesus' family tree. And so we'll look at that tonight. I'm going to read the uh, scripture for us, verses 1 through 17, and then we'll have prayer, and then I'd like to share with you some of the um, items that are on display in this family tree of Jesus as we look back at his ancestry. Matthew chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, uh, the scripture reads, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Amenadab, Amenadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Ammon, and Ammon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begot Abiud, and Abiud Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor. Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achan, and Achan begot Eliud. Eliud begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Mathan, and Mathan begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So in all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this evening we come to you thankful for the opportunity to gather in this place of worship. We thank you for your word as we have read it and what it means to us. We pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts to understand it better so that we would know you better. We thank you for each one who's come tonight, and we pray that you will bless us and make us a blessing to each other as we encourage one another in the Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I know you're 
probably beginning in one way or another to make some preparations for Christmas. Uh, tomorrow's December the 1st. I used to think when I was a child that, you know, Christmas would never get here. And even when you got to the first day of December, it still seemed like a long ways off. Uh, but as I've gotten older, older, I've discovered that, you know, it doesn't take very long for three or four weeks to click off. It seems like, well, I know how it was before I retired. Um, it seems like you have Sunday and then you have Monday. Well, the next day is Wednesday and the next day is Saturday and you got to get ready for Sunday again. But I know there were some other days mixed in there, uh, seven days to every week, but still it seemed... Uh, seemed like the, the weeks were very short uh, and that especially at times uh, if you have a responsibility uh, in church on Sunday uh, to get ready for Sunday it seemed like you could use an extra two or three days during the week there uh, to get ready but you see preparations being made for Christmas um, cities are lighting Christmas trees and having Christmas parades um, uh, we got our church newsletter today uh, from the church where we belong, and it's just full of activities for the month of December with lots of uh, classes, uh, life groups or Sunday school groups making their plans for gatherings uh, to uh, fellowship together and celebrate the birth of Christ. And, uh, and so there are preparations being made for Christmas. Uh, in the scripture, Preparations were being made for Christmas as well. God was making plans for the coming of his son into the world. And as Matthew opens up his gospel here with this list of uh, 42 names, I believe it is, 42 names uh, of people uh, in his ancestry uh, through whom God was working out his plan to bring Jesus into the world. And when you begin to look at these uh, names of the people, um, I may have slaughtered some of the names there along the way, but you probably wouldn't know the difference, so I wasn't worried about it. Uh, but nevertheless, um, each of these names represents a generation of people uh, and uh, that, that God had been working through all uh, through the years uh, leading up to the time, the special time that uh, Paul describes in the book of Galatians as the fullness of time which was right for Jesus to make his appearance in this world. Uh, the incarnation of Christ, the becoming uh, of Jesus uh, into this world uh, as God in person uh, in human flesh. I want us to think tonight, as I said, um, about some of the things that are on display when you see this list of names and especially how uh, Matthew divides it up into three groups of 14 generations. Um, he, he, it seems and scholars seem to believe that this was a way that Matthew had that uh, he could summarize the ancestry of Jesus in a way that people could sort of get a grasp of it and uh, and, and uh, uh, and so uh, he, he gives it in groups of 14 and divides the time into three uh, epochs or, or periods of time uh, that relate to the coming of Jesus. But there's some things on display that I want you to take note of. And the first thing in particular is the grace of God being displayed uh, through this listing of names. Uh, as I read through them a while ago, um, some of the names, no doubt, were familiar. We, we know people like Abraham and David and maybe even uh, uh, some of the kings that are listed there in that second grouping. Uh, but there are a lot of people in this list that we don't know anything about other than their name is listed here. And especially as you get later on uh, in this listing into that third group of 14 where you have what we call the intertestamental period or the period of about uh, 400, 450 years between, between the, uh, the return from Babylon, uh, return from captivity and the time when Jesus was born. So there's just some names there that we don't know too much about. But the surprising thing about this listing of names is 
there's some names of people that you might not expect to be there. Um, for instance, you have the listing of, of these women, uh, three of them um, uh, scattered about uh, in, in the first part of the listing, and then you have Mary's name at the end who, to make a fourth uh, woman uh, in this listing. And each of those women who are listed there, uh, there's some surprising things about them. Uh, the first one that was mentioned was uh, Tamar, there in verse 3. Uh, she was a woman of questionable character. Uh, she was a woman who kind of got left out or forgotten about uh, back in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 38. Uh, and uh, she was married to one of, of uh, Judah's sons. And he died before they had any children. And in that culture, when that happened, uh, the next oldest brother would take uh, that, that widow to wife and raise up a child uh, to, uh, to the dead brother. And so that happened, and that son of Judah also died, and then Judah reneged on giving his third son away after the first two had died. And so Tamar came up with a scheme uh, to become a child through Judah himself, the, one of the brothers of Joseph, uh, one of the sons of Jacob. And so through her scheming, uh, she uh, became pregnant and bore twin sons who are then listed, and then one of them stays in the line of Jesus. Uh, but then there's also the mention of uh, a woman named Rahab, uh, who we read about in the book of Joshua, she was actually a Canaanite uh, and a prostitute, uh, a harlot. And uh, through the experiences of the spies, when they went into the land, um, they, uh, two, of the, two of the spies went in uh, as the Israelites were preparing to, uh, to come into the promised land and to take over the land. Uh, they ended up in the home of Rahab, whom she, whom she, they, uh, she hid them uh, from the city people who wanted to, uh, to get rid of them. And in the process, she adopted or became what we call a proselyte, uh, became a worshiper of Israel's God, uh, and uh, later on uh, uh, came into the promised land and settled with the children of Israel. But there again, she was a, a person of questionable character. And you wonder why in the world would this woman with this kind of character be in the family line of Jesus? And, and then there's Ruth. Uh, Ruth is mentioned. Uh, we read the delightful story about Ruth um, during the period of the judges and uh, how she was a Moabite. And so she was uh, uh, someone from a foreign country, uh, foreigners uh, to the Israelite people and people uh, with whom the Israelites were not supposed to associate because the ancestors of Ruth had actually tried to block the children of Israel from going through their land when they were headed on the way to the promised land. But here's a, an immigrant <coughs> lady, someone who's not of uh, Israelite descent who's in the line of Jesus and uh, uh, and then so you, you can go on through the list and see not only are these women there of questionable character but then there's a, begins a list of kings and you know there was a whole series of kings who ruled uh, Israel and Judah uh, beginning with King David and then his son Solomon and so forth uh, but some of the people on this list of kings were as ungodly a folk as ever you've ever ran across in your life. Uh, think about uh, Ahaz is mentioned there, uh, and in particular Manasseh and Ammon. These, these, Manasseh was a king who uh, actually sacrificed one of his children on an altar to a pagan god. And yet here are some kings, some key kings in the history of Israel and Judah, whose character you just you just wouldn't believe, and yet they were in the line of Jesus. And so you look at all of these these names, and and if you if I could bring out one thing in particular about 
Jesus's association through his family tree with some of these ungodly, wicked people, I would say this, that Jesus was born not to avoid our sinful world, but to bear the sins of our sinful world. So why wouldn't he have in his ancestry people whose lives illustrated uh, uh, being uh, characterized or a part of the, the problem of the sinful world? And so uh, thinking of that, even the best of them, think about David or Solomon who, gets, who get high praise in the scriptures, even both of them had questionable episodes in their lives that would bring shame to the name of God. And yet they were in Jesus' ancestry. Um, so, uh, just to sort of summarize, even the foreign and dishonorable were included in Jesus' ancestry. Noble men and men who were miserable failures are in that list. The famous folks and then some very ordinary folks, uh, those that we only have their names and don't know anything else about them. We can imagine what might could have been said about them. But all of these people are just representative of the world into which Jesus came, and he came with the purpose of bearing the sins of the sinners in this sinful world. So God's grace, it's a measure of God's grace. God in his grace worked through each of these people uh, and their family line to bring Jesus into the world. Another item on display here in this list concerns the sovereignty of God. Uh, sovereignty of God, that, that's a doctrine that we hold that uh, has a reference to the supreme authority of God. God is the supreme authority uh, and over uh, all things and all people and all places. Uh, he's in control. Um, and it follows logically that we would have such a doctrine because God is described in Scripture as both the creator and the ruler of his creation. Um, there are a couple of Scripture verses that uh, bring this out. Uh, I could read more. There are lots of them in the Psalms, but I picked out two from the New Testament. Uh, one of those uh, has to do with uh, a letter of Paul to Timothy. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6.15, uh, uh, Paul is writing, and he says, which he will manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's talking about God and the fact that he's going to send Jesus again. And he describes God in these terms as being he who is the blessed and only potentate. That's a word that's used to talk about kingship or royalty. Uh, but he is the blessed and only King of kings and Lord of lords. And that's to speak of God's sovereignty. He, he's in control. He has authority over. Uh, another place where Paul writes some similar thoughts uh, is in the book of Ephesians. In the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul is talking about what God has accomplished in sending Christ into the world. And in Ephesians 1, 11, uh, he says, In him... Uh, we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Uh, God is in the business of accomplishing his will. And, and, and he's um, moving and, and directing. And uh, all of his actions are coordinated to the point that he's working out his will here uh, in this creation that he's made. And, and the fact that, um, that, that if, if that is who God is, and there's nobody going to stop him from accomplishing what he wills to accomplish. And so even in this list, in the coming of Jesus into the world, God was about the business of working out his will so that 
uh, Jesus would arrive on the scene at just the time and at just the place that God determined for that to happen. And there was not going to be anybody or anything that would prevent that from taking place. And when you begin to look at uh, how Matthew has laid out this uh, genealogical survey of the life of Jesus, you remember we, we talked about the fact that he broke it into three time periods, uh, the time from Abraham when God uh, brought, called out this man uh, and uh, de de declared to him, that, determined that through him he was going to bless all the nations of the earth, all the peoples of the earth. Uh, that was the, the, the ancestor of the Jewish people. And uh, that beginning with Abraham and running through the time period of David, the first king, that's the first segment of, of history um, for the Jewish people and for God's timetable for bringing Jesus into the world. And then there was a time period from David to the Babylonian captivity, and uh, that was a, a sort of a second phase of, of salvation history. And then from the Babylonian captivity to the time of Christ, uh, there were certain events uh, taking place and God was working things together to bring about the coming of Jesus with regard to that third period. We might say of that first period, Abraham to David, that it was supposed to be a period of faith. In fact, when you start off with Abraham, it says that Abraham believed God and God credited unto him as righteousness, his faith, uh, his faith in God. But then as time went on, Anything but faith was exhibited by the majority of people uh, until the time of David. With the coming of David and the establishing of kingship, there was supposed to be uh, there were supposed to be godly kings on the throne that would guide the nation into proper worship of God. Uh, and it started off pretty good with David. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart. Uh, he made preparations for the building of a temple where God would be honored and worshipped among the people and the people have a central worship place to come and worship God. But then it went downhill from there, again, with David's personal life and then uh, the birth of his son Solomon and Solomon started off pretty good but then he went downhill. He was noted to be one of the wisest men on the face of the earth ever to live and and yet by the time of his life, he had married uh, hundreds of wives and had uh, a thousand concubines on top of that. And each one of them came with a package, came with their own religion. Many of them from foreign countries who worshiped pagan deities and so forth. And by the time Solomon died, uh, paganism had infiltrated the country. And so what was supposed to be royalty uh, uh, under godly leadership uh, degenerated uh, until we find some of these most ungodly of individuals like Manasseh and Ammon and Ahaz and a few others that it just would seem that you know God's plan didn't work out too well with that with with and then there was that third period the Babylonian captivity uh, was brought on as a punishment or a disciplinary measure to call the nation back to, to God. But um, there again, it started off pretty well with people like Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, but even by the 400, uh, about 400 BC, the, the nation had drifted yet again. And you find that the, 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 that which was supposed to be rebuilding and uh, re-energizing the people for God uh, fizzled out once more uh, and by about 400 even the voices of prophets had ceased and for about 400 years there was silence with regard uh, to a prophetic spokesman who would step forth and uh, people practiced religion but it was just a dead uh, law orientated uh, religion and so that didn't turn out too well either and if you back off and you say, well, let's look at these three periods of time. They're very dark periods in the life of the nation, by and large. And, and yet, at the end of that third period, the time was right for Jesus to come. And Jesus comes as the perfect man of faith. 
and he becomes the perfect royal godly king and he becomes the hope for the fulfillment of all of the other promises of God and that had been neglected or, or, or uh, there was a failure to concentrate on. I love the, the little phrase in the, the hymn, uh, the, A Little Town of Bethlehem, uh, A Little Town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Uh, and, then, and then the last of that first um, uh, phrase is the hopes and fears of all the youth. Hopes on the one hand and the fears, uh, the negatives on the other hand of all the years. These, were, these all came together at the same time and Jesus was born and he becomes the focus uh, to settle the fears and bring to fulfillment the hopes of God's people. And then the last thing I mentioned on display here concerns the incarnation of God's Son himself. Uh, you notice, uh, as I read, we, we got to verse 16, and Matthew breaks his pattern. Uh, he views the terminology through all of these generations from Abraham uh, down to uh, a man named Jacob, and he talks about so-and-so begot so-and-so. That's uh, King James, New King James, uh, NIV uses the term so-and-so was the father of so-and-so. And then um, the Christian Standard Bible says so-and-so fathered so-and-so. And so you get this long chain through 42 names, or, well, 40 names, till you come to Jacob. But then Matthew makes a subtle change in the way he expresses the coming of Jesus and he focuses on the incarnation, which in the succeeding verses, uh, beginning in verse 18, he's going to go back and give details about. But he talks about Jacob begot Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And that... Uh, and those, that expression, the way he's put that together, he's letting us know that Jesus did not come about through the same process that all of these other people uh, came through as they came into the world. He lets us know clearly that Joseph, through whom Jesus legally uh, became a child, because that was the custom in uh, Jewish life at that time. Uh, legally, Jesus was Joseph's child, but the bloodline ran through Mary. The humanity of Mary, the human nature of, of Jesus, came through Mary's line. So Joseph was the husband of Mary, and then the phrase of whom was born Jesus, the whom there is feminine, not masculine, so again, it points back to Mary, through whom was born Jesus, who's called the Christ, the Messiah, which the word Christ is equivalent to in the Hebrew. Um, the Hebrew Messiah is equivalent to the Greek Christ. This Jesus, who, be, who is coming to the world, has, is God in person, in human form. And he'll go on, uh, Matthew will, to talk about that, uh, break out into, into more detail how that takes place in verses 18 through 25, uh, following this section that we've been looking at. So uh, there are lots of interesting things to look at here, and I've only picked up on a few, but hopefully it's something that helps us uh, think ahead to Christmas, and that's what I tried to do Sunday. Uh, and what I'm trying to do now is to help us not just, you know, go through the motions here and be real busy for a few weeks and then finally discover, hey, it's Christmas Day and we need to stop. No, we need to stop now and begin to think about preparing our hearts and lives so that we can give Jesus the proper honor that he deserves. Uh, 
when we celebrate his birthday on December the 25th. Uh, Matthew 121 here goes on to report to us exactly why it was that Jesus came. He came to save his people from his sins. And if we'd only thought on that between now and Christmas, we'd have plenty to think about and plenty to thank our God for as well. So uh, may God bless uh, with that. Um, let me read you just one little quote out of uh, Max Lucado's Because of Bethlehem. When he's talking about all these people, I love the way he talks about uh, what, uh, what the, the strange things, the strange people in Jesus' uh, family tree. Uh, he says here that Matthew is making a point. Chaos cannot keep Christ out of his world. The Messiah was born not because of his ancestors, but in spite of them. Tamar was abandoned, Ruth was an immigrant, and Rahab was a harlot. David was an adulterer, Solomon was a philanderer. The family tree of Jesus is gnarled and crooked. Some of the kings were bloodthirsty and godless, yet God had promised that Jesus would come and Jesus came. Aren't we glad? I sure am. Thank you.